Chapter 1. Now or Never It was the perfect time for leaving. Weather conditions were finally right. A steady breeze blew from the south. Plus, there was just enough moonlight to see by. July 3rd, 2008. This would be the date our family would always remember, assuming, of course, that we lived to tell about it. Hurry up. The wind won't last forever, I said. Three shadowy figures, my sister Sarah and my parents, fumbled with their luggage. With me, we were the Newell family. We lived in west suburban Minneapolis, for a few more minutes at least. Shut up, Miles, Sarah muttered. She was 12, going on 13, and her carry-on bag overflowed with last-minute additions. I couldn't complain. I had my own private stuff including a small, sealed jar that would be hard to explain to my family, so I didn't try. Right now, one of Sarah's stupid paperbacks dropped with a thud onto the sidewalk. I sighed and went to help her. I'm not leaving, Sarah said, jerking away from me. Everybody's going to die anyway, so why can't we die in our own house? She plopped down onto the lawn. Pale pumice puffed up around her and hung in the air like a ghostly double. That was the weird thing about the volcanic ash. It had been falling softly, softly falling, for over two years now, and sometimes it was almost beautiful. Tonight, the rock flower suspended in the air made a wide, furry white halo around the moon. Its giant, raccoon-like eyeballs stared down and made the whole neighborhood look x-rayed. Nobody's gonna die, I said, though if we stay in the city, we might, I muttered to myself. How do you know, Sarah said. She sat there stubbornly, clutching her elbows. Actually, I don't, which is why we're leaving. Sarah swore at me. Anything logical really pissed her off these days. Arthur, my mother said sharply to my father. Help out any time. My father coughed briefly and stepped forward. Think of it this way, Sarah. We're heading to the lake, he said, his voice muffled under his dust mask. We'll get to our cabin, kick back, ride this out, Swiss Family Robinson all the way. He manufactured a short laugh that fell about 50 yards short of sincere. Sometimes I worried more about him than my sister and mother. They at least knew how to put wood in a fireplace. My father was a real city guy, a musician, a jazz drummer. My mother added, We all agreed, remember? As Miles said, up at Birch Bay, we'll have more control of things like heat, food, and water. When things improve, when the ash stops falling, and when there's gasoline, and when the food stores are full again, we'll come back home. Something, maybe the dust, caught briefly in her throat. Miles said we'll have to stay up there all winter and all next year. Maybe longer, Sarah said. My parents were silent. They looked at each other, and my father shrugged. What does Miles know, Sarah said loudly. He's barely 16. Why are we listening to him? Can we not wake the neighbors? I whispered urgently. Sarah swore at me, and suddenly we were arguing like children. Enough, my mother said to us. Natalie, everybody knows her as Nat, which is a good name because she's small and intense, reached down and yanked Sarah to her feet. Think of it like a vacation. Maybe a little longer than usual, but still a vacation. Or better, pretend you're Mary Poppins, I said to Sarah. When the wind was right, up, up, and away she went. Miles, Nat said in warning. She looked to my father for help. He turned away to a small duffel bag and checked its zipper. Typical. Even though he was home nowadays, most of the time it still felt like he was gone. Me? I had work to do. I went to the garage and eased up the big door. Inside sat my supreme invention of all time, the Alley Princess. I rolled her outside, and in the moonlight, she was beautiful. Perched on her six bicycle wheels, the Alley Princess looked like a gigantic grasshopper poised to spring away at first touch, or a dragonfly ready to take flight. Down her center, like an exoskeleton, was a bicycle built for two. The tandem bike with inline recumbent seats had belonged to my parents. It was one of those high-priced, spend-quality-time-together gifts that my father had bought for my mother. I had seen them together on it maybe once. The bike didn't have five miles on it. Attached to the main bike, like legs on a water strider bug, were two regular bikes, 
Sarah's and mine to be exact. Their pedals, chains, and sprockets were hooked to the tandem bike with, through a common axle, which was no small task of design and mechanics, may I humbly say. I didn't want to count how many skin knuckles and U-clamps and quarter-inch nuts and bolts and lock washers and hours of hacksawing that all took. Amazing, really, my father said as he stared at the bike car. Thank you, I said modestly. The princess, shaped roughly in a triangle, had a cargo bay of four lightweight aluminum lawn recliners bolted on either side of the mainframe and secured to a wire mesh floor. The main supplies, tents, sleeping bags, tools, food, and water, were already packed. If things went totally bust, we could always unload the princess and start a pedicab business. Straight up from the center of the alley princess rose my true inspiration, the 16-foot wooden mast and sail that had belonged to my father's boat, the Tonka Miss. To make the princess, I had cannibalized every piece of sports equipment the Newell family owned. Now boarding, I said, trying to sound upbeat. Trying to sound as if we were heading out on a fun-filled family vacation. Are you sure she'll carry us all? my mother asked, hesitating at the princess. Yes, I said sharply. My tolerance for annoyance was low these days. Maybe it was the times. Maybe it was turning 16. Maybe it was a combination of the two. I had waited for years to be old enough to get my driver's license, and now that I was 16, nobody drove anymore. Some luck. But the princess had nothing to do with luck. I would built her from top to bottom. There was no way she wouldn't work. Sarah was up and moving, thanks to my mother. From sitting in the dust in her black clothes, Sarah now had a white butt. Ash on her butt. But my sense of humor had slipped a bit these days, and I didn't say anything. Actually, her smudged clothes gave her a black and white camouflage look perfect for tonight. What do I do now, Sarah said. At the, prin at the, princess, made at the princess, she made like she didn't know where to get on. Talk about annoying. I'd shown her ten times minimum how the princess worked, where to sit, how to pedal. Here, I said, hoisting my sister up into the left cargo bay. Sit here and you won't have to do anything, which is nothing new. She shot back some remark, which I ignored. With the stiff breeze tonight, we could get by with less than a full crew pedaling. I made sure she was situated. As my parents climbed aboard, I strummed the main guy wires for one last check. Fine lines of rock flower puffed away and shimmered like frost in the air. The wires were as tight as bass guitar strings. I went down my pre-sale checklist. Masks? I asked. My parents nodded. We tightened our elastic drawstrings behind our heads. Sarah begrudgingly followed suit. The ash was so fine that it was easy to forget about masks. The white, surgical-type ovals were free at any hospital, police station, or post office, and most people wore them. Those who were too cool to be seen wearing one in public soon coughed like coal miners on four packs a day. My mother turned to look back at our house. It was a huge house, way larger than any family needed, big enough for a half-dozen families, and it was not our real house. That was in South Minneapolis, where I grew up. But after my father made it with the Shawnee Kingston Jazz Band, we moved to the suburbs. He figured that a major house with pool and tennis court would make up for him being on the road all the time. At least, that was my theory. But I always felt stupid when my friends, all of whom lived in normal-sized houses, bust out with their skateboards or their tennis rackets so they could play on the Newell family concrete or splash in our pool. My excuse was that my mother had her business, a small literary agency, in our home, and she entertained clients a lot. But that was lame. Anyone could see that her business took up only a couple of upstairs rooms. Mostly, I liked to visit my friends back in the old neighborhood, rather than have them come here to this house that was only a moat and turret short of a castle. Trouble was, after I visited my old neighborhood and then came back home, I felt strange. Kind of twilight zone. Like living in the suburbs was not real life like I was neither wolf nor dog. But my combination garage and shop, I would miss. I've always been a tool type. I've built things, starting with Lego, since I could remember. For Christmas and my birthday, my parents bought me tools, and over the years, I had built up a workshop that looked like a small hardware store. 
My toughest part of packing for this trip was choosing which tools to take and which ones to leave hanging lonely in the garage. We'll be back, Nat whispered to the silent hulking house. My sister covered her eyes with her hands. My father stared at the house as if something in his life was ending. But not me. Nothing was ending for Miles Arthur Newell. I was five feet, six inches tall, 136 and a half pounds, and still growing. I had blue eyes and buzzed hair under an old rancid cap, and I was better with tools than all the home improvement guys on television. No stupid natural disaster was going to cheat me out of anything.